So when the HDNG decided to put together this uh, technology leaders panel, they asked the three panelists today if they would be willing to do it, and they all immediately said yes. About two weeks later, they went back to him and said, oh, we have some good news for you. We got Rich Siegel to moderate the panel. All three of them together said, please, no. <laughs> they, um, uh, but it's, um, I, I'm honored to be here at h g uh, to do this panel. Um, you know, I get invited to do sessions and do panels all over the world, and for some strange reason, I never get invited back. And I'm hoping that something's gonna change this time. If I get the three to come up on the stage now, I'd much appreciate it. So the contest is gonna be, who is the smartest of the three? Oh, uh, <laughs> wow. Oh, boy. Okay, so we're gonna have, our contest is the more, it's a friendlier contest. We're not gonna really check their intelligence, but their awareness of things that are going on in the world. Now, I made a comment in my column once about TripAdvisor. You know, I call TripAdvisor the enemy of the hotel industry. Uh, and when I wrote that, the next day I got a call from this big shop from TripAdvisor. He says, you know, we're working so hard to have a good relationship with the hotel industry. How could you write that? I said, it was true. But um, <laughs> so the TripAdvisor, um, we all use it. I am sure everybody uses it now. Look at it to get the reviews. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our panelists a simple question. We're going to put a quote out there, and you're going to tell me if it's a TripAdvisor review or it's a lyric from a Taylor Swift song. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who I'd bet to win this, but um, I have ideas. Okay, uh, so um, Jeff, we're going to start with you and come across. Wait. Are you ready? Ooh, how I was wrong. Instead of apologizing, we went crazy. Well, you're supposed to sing it, Rich. That would <laughs> help it resonate. What if it's a come on. I'm going to go Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift? <laughs> okay, Chris, you ready? I'm ready. It rains in your bedroom. <laughs> Everything is wrong. I'm going to go with Taylor Swift. I'm going to stay on the, on the line with Taylor Swift. And the answer? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do I get partial credits? Again? Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. absolutely. 50-50. <laughs> My daddy's going to show you how sorry you'll be. TripAdvisor. <laughs> <laughs> TripAdvisor? The answer? Uh, no, it's uh, right. <laughs> Jeff? Oh, we got more. He told me he was going to take his time and not rush me. <laughs> uh, to be safe, I'm going TripAdvisor. <laughs> TripAdvisor. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> Chris? State the obvious. I didn't get my perfect fantasy. <laughs> oh, TripAdvisor. <laughs> uh, oh! Wow. <laughs> All right, Vivek, it's time. Vivek, if you said, right. if you just said you're sorry, I know that we could work it out somehow. That's Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Jeff, you are my master. I am your slave. <laughs> Rich Siegel said that. <laughs> <laughs> Trip advisor. Yeah, we'll lay that. <laughs> Chris, coming back around here would be bad for your health. I'll say Trip Advisor. <laughs> ah, yeah. I should stay with my kids. And Vivek, it made for a funny story all these years later. <laughs> Hmm. Try Taylor Swift. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. right. One more, final round. Jeff, smoking a cigar next to a no smoking sign? Trip advisor. All right. <laughs> Chris, we decided to move the furniture <laughs> so we could dance. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, now if I don't go with Taylor Swift, it will be... <laughs> Um, so, I'll go with TripAdvisor. I'm mean, gonna stay on that. Oh, yes! Uh, <laughs> you started out so good, I can't believe it. I know, it. doggone it. In fact, you get the final one. Take a deep breath. Tomorrow morning, you will pray. 
Taylor Swift. <laughs> we can't win. I'm going to make a round for all. All right. <laughs> okay, to start the session off, what I'd like to do is have you each uh, introduce yourselves, a little bio on who you are, and, um, but also share with the audience um, what your biggest challenge today is in your role. Vivek Shaiva, I've been uh, in this role uh, since for about eight, almost eight years now. Um, I, prior to that, I was uh, actually an advisor to Blackstone, helping with some of their uh, acquisition in real estate. And then prior to that, I was with uh, GE at NBC Universal in New York City. Um, so the biggest challenge that I face uh, these days is, I think, uh, consumer engagement in the light of rapidly evolving technologies and how we kind of keep pace with, uh, with that, uh, that trend. and make sure that we deliver technologies that are absolutely current and engaging. I think that's, that seems to be the biggest challenge these days. I've been in the hospitality industry now 12 years. I spent 14 years prior to that with Hallmark Cards in Kansas City, Missouri. So retail, have always been in IT my uh, whole career. Um, it was really great coming up through actually that retail side. A lot of similarities from retail to um, the hospitality industry. Um, a lot of differences, uh, but a lot of nuances that kind of helped to lead me into the hospitality area. I worked with uh, MGM Mirage was my first hospitality gaming experience. I had most of that in gaming as well. Cosmopolitan, Kempton, and now with uh, Omni. I guess my biggest challenge now is uh, managing uh, analytics and the expectations of our ownership and executive team all the way down to line level business analysts uh, how to effectively use analytics to make good performance management decisions. Uh, it's, it's actually very interesting that uh, our ownership group had really a false expectations. We, we purchased Cognos BI, this has been several years ago, and they thought out of the box that they would get this miraculous investment in this knowledge that would help them make decisions just by buying this one tool. So it, it leads to obviously where uh, we have a great opportunity and responsibility to our operators to help them understand the technology and how we can enable technology to make good decisions from an operation standpoint. Uh, back in October of last year, I was voted off the technology island, and now I'm part <laughs> of the operations team, and I think we'll get into a bit more of a discussion a little bit later on the changing role of those of us uh, who are part of the technology world itself. Getting ready to celebrate my 15th uh, anniversary uh, with Hyatt. However, in between years 12 and 13, I was uh, someplace else. Uh, Vivek was actually a customer of mine uh, when, we were at, when I was at Travel Click, and I did survive that, uh, oh. those character building <laughs> moments. Uh, but I was also uh, at Pegasus as well for a period of time. I ran the commission processing business with a great team of individuals. And uh, then when we reorganized, I was responsible for global service delivery. So I have a little bit of a unique perspective as I've been both on the vendor side uh, as well as uh, the hotelier side. Uh, of the equation uh, itself. Now, uh, as it relates to what keeps me up at night, I agree with uh, Vivek and Chris's comments, but if I look now at what my new role is, uh, in an operations role, it's really change management, and there's so much going on with technology. And how do, as we're working to develop technology solutions and deploy them, how do we ensure that the operators are ready to adopt it, understand it, use it, and get the behavioral changes that we're expecting. As you're in position of having to acquire new technology, what inspires you to choose a vendor over another? Uh, I think from a vendor selection perspective, uh, you're looking at, obviously, first product. Does the product meet the business requirements or the problem statement that you're trying to solve for? Uh, and does it do it with <clears throat> high quality? Uh, also, from a vendor perspective, looking at the uh, financial stability of the company, the management team, the executive team, making sure that they are um, a solid uh, team working together with a vision and a strategy and a roadmap for what that product is going to do. 
and then serviceability, I would say, is the third thing. Uh, many categories in between there, but serviceability, their ability to support the system after it's installed. Uh, you know, not to uh, focus on the negative, but some of the things that you know, just kind of rub us the wrong way is not understanding the ecosystem in which we're operating about. It's all about integration and bringing us a solution that does not integrate into our ecosystem or is just another bolt-on creates yet another fractured experience for guests and colleagues. So taking the time to understand the ecosystem that we operate in and how it's going to integrate in. And then the other element is the uh, infamous community model. And we get what the benefits are, the perceived benefits of a community model are. Uh, but while it's interesting to know what the competitors are doing, what Hilton and Marriott is doing, whenever you start the conversation, let me tell you what Hilton's doing at Marriott, I don't care. You know, uh, the conversation was talking about the hospitality industry being in a state of crisis. And they, we've created an environment where there's a booking brand and the stay brands. And most often they're not the same. We're challenged with trying to, how do we differentiate ourselves as hoteliers? And while the community model is good from a tactical standpoint, if all it does is it helps continue that sea of sameness, it's not of interest to us. So how can you help us make each of our brands unique and to help prop up the value proposition of our stay brands? Uh, I think there was, there was a, the talk earlier today, we, we were mentioned about the fact that the architecture that we have in our industry and in, in generally in IT as a whole, there's a lot of legacy architecture and in, uh, technology out there. So when I look at any new vendors today, I, I really look at, I don't want a rehash of 20-year-old technology with a fancy GUI in front of it where the underlying architecture really hasn't evolved to newer technologies. So that's pretty critical for me. At the same time, the user interface is absolutely critical as well. Uh, that's the expectation. I mean, people are used to you know, consumer-facing applications that are wildly different from the old GUI, and as the millennials come into the workforce, they're not going to tolerate you know, an, an ancient-looking <laughs> application that was designed uh, you know, 10 years ago. So that's really what we look for. If a vendor has a technology that's not less than seven years old, built from the ground up, I almost feel like not even talking to them. So I really, we really are looking for newer technologies, and I understand the, the catch is that you know, some of these players are fresh startups and, and such, and there's a risk element to your point about financial stability. So to some extent, it depends on what area within your business you're deploying that application. If it's highly mission critical, we obviously want to you know, uh, check on the background as well. But you know, it's a balance between risk and, and getting really what you should be getting in, in this day and age. Uh, took a risk and uh, went with a system that was maybe not meeting your criteria, was, was new, was not established, and, and had it work out? I had a couple and have had a couple that didn't go so well, so right. I've experienced both. We generally work through it, for the most, at least in my experience, we generally work through issues. Not that we haven't had issues, but nothing devastating that we had to throw away the product. That hasn't happened yet. One of the things I've learned, and I've done this uh, at sessions, about the changing role of the CIO. I mean, in many people will say the role of CIO historically has been to maintain data, maintain technology, maintain. Um, do you see that role, be in your positions today, do you see that role changing? Uh, as we look at what's going on in technology in the world, right, as you look at the evolution of the rapid, breathtaking evolution of technology. And then you look at you know, how our business leaders are using applications and selecting technologies. It's really, it's, at least in my experience, it's dawned to people that you can't really make decisions without the technologist engaged. So you know, marketing goes off and you know, talks to some vendor and, and gets some application. Firstly, the, the, there's a profusion of options. Lots and lots of options. So people are getting overwhelmed with the amount of technology that's out there and, and making decisions on how to bring it in. And that's where you know, we as, as IT leaders have to step up and really engage the business. And I know it's kind of cliche, everybody keeps saying that, but unless everybody gets the message that we are really one team, we work for the same company, we want to make the right decisions for the company, 
And that message has to come from the CEO level, absolutely. If it doesn't come from that level, you can keep working in your silos. So somehow you've got to kind of get the CEO to, to realize, a lot of people are realizing it, there's really one partnership. You've got to make joint decisions on technology selection, and, and that's how you'll be successful. And, and that's, that's what I keep driving all the time, I and mean, to make sure that engagement uh, is pretty tight. You know, through my career, I've seen uh, how the role of the CIO has changed and evolved um, from being very much that order taker, keep everything running, you know, system availability, that was always the main focus, to a point where I think now it's, it's critical, as Vivek said, technology is just pervasive through everything. So there's nothing that you do that doesn't involve some form of technology. As a result of that, I think we as um, technologists have to embrace some of the weaknesses that we typically have uh, which is communication and collaboration and interpersonal skills, and sometimes those aren't the, the forte of, of a technologist. And so we have to make sure that we have the abilities and, and go out there and get those skills and, and practice it, and sometimes it's stepping out of our comfort zone and making sure that we're able to talk the talk with the CMO, talk the talk with the CEO, talk about um, HR and recruiting and talent management responsibilities. I think it's our responsibility as an executive on an executive team to be the leader, you know, and that, that doesn't mean just in your, your silo, your vertical of expertise. It's that vertical, but then across and, and providing, you know, good input support to the rest of the executive team to make it a, a strong group. And as a strong group, we've seen that's where companies strive and thrive is those that have a strong executive team. So. Uh, you know, it's our responsibility to make sure that it's still systems are running because that's the competency and the integrity piece. If you don't have that, they're not going to listen to you in the first place. So build that integrity and then make sure that you do the good job of communicating and, and uh, sometimes going to that marketing person and having them help you with the marketing of your own technology department. You know, celebrate those wins that we often don't do um, too frequently. Do you, how often do you meet with the marketing people? Is it a weekly thing, a monthly thing? Is it, uh, you know? I, I probably talk to my CMO on a daily basis. Uh, we have a weekly update just on marketing projects with me and my CMO and my teams. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the team level, like one level below me, they are daily. They are engaged, we are engaged in projects together and they're meeting daily on those projects uh, all the time. Yeah, pretty close. Marketing is our biggest spend. Out of my budget, I think marketing has the biggest spend of, of technology. So therefore, yeah, that engagement is pretty. Which is pretty the norm today. Yeah. So Jeff, being that you were a technology person forever, now you're an operations person, it'd be interesting to get your perspective uh, of how you look at technology today in your role and versus the interaction you have with the, those that are responsible for the technology. Yeah, I still viewed myself as an accidental technologist. I started out uh, on the operations side. Uh, but you know, some of the conversations, and I think I'll go back to some of Doug's opening comments uh, to start the conference, and what we're seeing in the role of the CIO is not only is the role changing, but the average tenure is also shrinking as well. Each of the major chains have had a change in, uh, the most of the uh, chains have had a, a change. Some have opted to not put a CIO in place. Some have opted to merge a CIO and a CMO role together. And that kind of spawned some discussions at Hyatt about what do we need to do with the technology role. When Mike was with us, uh, the function reported into the finance organization. Having technology report into a CFO position, there's a different mindset, a different view of technology and what you should focus on. Uh, with uh, Alex coming on board, we shifted the role into a dual reporting relationship into our chief operating officer and our um, CEO directly. So there's more direct engagement with the business versus going through uh, the finance organization. And then Alex said, you know, the other reason why, you know, there are two reasons why CIOs typically end up leaving. And it's either due to, you know, a data breach related issue or it's either a perceived or real disconnect with the business uh, itself. And while the technology team was working to change their focus on what solutions we were going to deliver, there was a concern about ensuring there was a tight connection between technology and marketing and technology and operations. And they shifted my role, including the technology portfolio, into operations. 
So my team's primary responsibility really is twofold. One is to help establish operating standards to what's going to bring the brand to life and then identifying what technology gaps exist in, in order to enable that as well as what other technology we can bring to the market to align uh, with our brands. So my team serves as a bridge between marketing, operations, and technology. And then once we determine what it is we're going to do, my team is then working with the operations staff to look at change management, behavioral change management. Just putting the technology in place doesn't ensure adoption, doesn't ensure utilization. My team is going to be responsible for behavioral change, operational change, to ensure that whatever the technology team delivers, it's an investment well made. So that's kind of the shift in role and focus for me. So how do you Want measure? Job? Yeah, how okay. do you do that measure? How do you measure the behavior change? Uh, very carefully. No, <laughs> we're, we are just starting. We're in the early stages. Part of it also is you know, trying to, as we're delivering technology. It's not about the technology, it's more about the utilization and the solution uh, itself. We look at NPS scores. You know, some of our biggest challenges uh, from an NPS standpoint is that arrival experience. So what are we doing to change that arrival experience? Part of it is, yes, layering on technology, but then I'll share with you, and I'll, I'll pick on my own you know, chain. Didn't happen at this hotel, but it really bothers me. You know, having been in technology, we developed this great welcome screen and welcome window. Hello, Mr. Bavu, I can't pronounce my name. Uh, and they have my name up in front of them, and they say, is this the first time staying at Hyatt? And I breathe deeply, and I take a step back, and I said, just take the time and look at the screen. What does it tell you about me? Oh, I see you're a Gold Passport member. Thank you. Okay. Check the box. I see you've stayed at Hyatt 50 times in the last two years. Great. Stayed at this hotel just last week. And then they'll look a horror. Oh, crap, he works for Hyatt in front of them. So yeah, I, like I said, listen, I'm not frustrated with you as the individual. I'm frustrated with us in how we're delivering the technology and getting those changes. So part of the you know, long way of getting metrics with NPS uh, scores, also colleague feedback and doing empathy sessions and to continue to iterate and, and move those things forward. So we can uh, continue to jump around um, because of what I do for a living and the way we talk about trends that are happening in the industry. Um, one of the big things, and, and it's great that we have like full service hotels, high end, and we have limited service too. The mobile technology, I mean, are you guys just totally, you know, going crazy trying to figure out what, how to stay one step ahead? Is it something um, that you're actually diving into now? I'm kind of curious to where you're at in the whole mobile world. So we, uh, we spent, 2014, rolling out a new website, uh, responsive design, and, you know, making it to where uh, it was a more enjoyable experience. Uh, strategy for doing that because we wanted to hit the, the website first before then diving into the mobile side of things. So we had a mobile enabled application, uh, basically shut it off after that because we wanted to make sure that the um, experience was the right one from, a, from an application, mobile application perspective. So now we're working with marketing and uh, designing what um, here in May we're going to roll out a, a new mobile app that focuses on reservation, hotel information, loyalty, which some of these other folks, you know, and other brands have, you know, jumped out there a long time ago. Um, so we're, we're now joining the crowd because obviously mobility and the, the ability of our guests to interact and do services via their own device is obviously critical and it's going to only continue to, to grow as we get, go further. I think, um, you know, we talked about vendors and, and integration and that's one that's rising right now too is as you talk about these services, how do you make it a seamless experience for the guest so that uh, they're using it to pull up, you know, request their car from valet or request towels or whatever it may be, that that experience is similar in how they do that. And so when you're working with different vendors to provide those kind of services, it makes it, you know, more challenging. So it's something from my perspective when you think of the human factors of the experience that a guest has with doing any of those services, you've got to take that into consideration and then make sure that you're delivering uh, a, a smooth, a common voice, but a smooth interface and an interaction with them. So those are the kind of things that we're working on right now with the, from the mobile perspective. Doing that first, and then as we're 
moving from that initial information is also thinking about it from an associate perspective. So how do we put, like, uh, like Jeff was saying, put the right tools in the hands of our associates so that they can make sure that they give that experience? I think on, on mobile, there are really two elements to it. Firstly, it's absolutely critical. It's mission critical in, in, the, in our digital marketing space to have a strong mobile presence. And there's mobile web and mobile app, and we treat the two of them very differently. So because who's going to download a hotelier's app on your iPhone? It's, you know, it's, it's only going to be mostly going to be your loyalty members, people who are already engaged with you. And then the mobile web is, is for really targeting new customers, right? So the approach in the past, our approach was kind of you know, responsive design, like one side. Let's, you don't want to has, you know, manage like two different apps for you know, different platforms. It's kind of quite difficult and expensive. So we thought that you know, one app can, one design can work for everyone. But we are realizing that actually, you need to target the audience is different. The design of a mobile web app has to be different from your website as well. So I have kind of mixed feelings about responsive design. You know, you design for one platform and it automatically adjusts to the other. I kind of I, I'm not bought into that. I think each app or each experience should be tailored for that form factor from the ground up, uh, and that's what we are trying to you know reconcile around. Then the second element of, of that whole experience is that as things evolve, and again, we talked a lot about it today, about how you know, we're competing with the OTAs and other, other, other providers who have you know, more than the budget of our entire company's revenue uh, pushing into technology. Uh, and I think where, where that, how that, the challenge that poses to us is that how do we make the experience on our platform so unique that it's different so we, tap, we, got to, we, can, we have the advantage of being able to tap into functionality and services that a third party would not. And to make that happen, what we're doing on the back end, or what anyone, I think a lot of people are doing on the back end, is to services enable a whole lot of functionality that in the past has been kind of hidden behind uh, closed doors. And that's, uh, that's another big push that you know, you've got to start with the back end start services, uh, make, put a services layer. We already have that and we're just expanding it a lot so that we can deliver quickly as needed whatever functionality that you know, marketing and others kind of decide we need to deliver to our guests uh, through our mobile platforms. I agree with uh, both Chris uh, and Vivek's uh, comments and we're focused on you know, the same areas. We're also going through a little bit of a cleanup. I think in many cases we bought in and started doing a lot of things and it was in a scattered type of approach. Um, it's about you go to the App Store, go to Google Play, and look at the number of Hyatt apps, and they're numerous. Uh, you know, there are too many out there. So part of what we're doing, in addition to getting that infrastructure in place, uh, focused on both guest and colleague experiences, is trying to control that and get it back into less of a, a, a fractured experience. And then how do we layer and integrate into one of the things that Chris keeps, keeps her up at night is the, are the data elements. And how do you use that mobility to create a truly personalized guest experience? And you know, getting that information in the hands of our colleagues so they're able to interact at the moment in time versus when the guests are 20 feet uh, away from you and then it's too late to uh, you know, catch that wow moment. So it's really bringing, you know, cleaning up what we have, focusing on mobility, but then really the tight integration of uh, you know, data mining and uh, personalization. Do you guys get involved in things like um, getting feedback from your, those that belong to your programs about what they want to see happen and does it come into play about what you're going to do next? Hyatt, uh, we have a top 500 group. Uh, uh, that uh, actually I think we have a few members uh, in the audience that we regularly uh, get feedback and we include them uh, in the design phase, the iteration phase, uh, and we think it's actually important. Uh, a lot of design-based thinking, empathy you know, sessions, and making sure we really understand uh, what the expected or the, the, that behavior is to go beyond service into caring, and the only way to do that is to tap in to both our guests as well as our colleagues do it all the time. And we do a lot of market research and we have customer advisory boards. In fact, we just had one uh, with our loyalty members. So we, we bring in people who are members of our select guests, which is our loyalty program, 
as well as then have separate ones where we do market research with just guests that have visited with the, the Omnis. Uh, we have um, the, the unique relationship too with the Global Hotel Alliance. So we're, uh, we have a reach out there internationally since we are mostly a domestic company but through the GHA, using them to understand too what the guest expectations are and their wants and desires. And um, also then tracking too anything new because you know in the years when I first got into um, hospitality, it was all about uh, going to a hotel and seeing the new cool stuff in the room. And boy, that's totally changed now. It's what do you have at home and what are the expectations of having that also in your room. So it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough, challenge to keep on the cusp of, you don't want to be on the bleeding edge, but you don't want to be on the cutting edge. You want to be a fast follower of what works and what they desire. So it's, it's always going to continue to be a challenge, but it's our responsibility, obviously, to keep the research going. So we engage our loyalty members in focus groups when we are designing new customer-facing apps and products. And I have kind of a conflicting perspective to that uh, in the sense that Yes, we need their feedback, but no, they don't always know what, you, what they really want, and you don't want to constrain your product. Sometimes, you know, the marketing folks will just focus on, this is what the customer wants, and I, hence I have the power to say, this is exactly what you'll build, and I'll just blindly follow what the customer wants. And that is a little dangerous. If, if Steve Jobs had followed what the customer wants, all iPhones would have keypads on it. You wouldn't have a <laughs> glass, right? Uh, so I think you always kind of keep that in mind that you got to listen to them. I, I, I just like to listen to them for problems, you know, if they're having specific problems with the, with the app or, or the product. But as it comes to innovation, I think it's a whole different ballgame altogether. Well, I think at one of the previous property, you know, I, that I was at, we, um, we found that just implementing technology for the sake of technology is a waste of money. Yeah. Uh, and can cause a, a lot of problems and challenges if it's not strategic and usable and, again, those human factor parts. So yeah. it does come back to a wise decision about investment as well. Yeah. Vivek, your commentary, I was, it reminds me of a meeting last week I was in with marketing. And uh, they will, you must do this. And you know, then you turn into, okay, let me talk to you a bit about the best way to, and I, wear, I was wearing both technology and operations. You know, don't, I'm not an order taker, the type of scenario. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want, we're not going to be successful. You need to find a way you know, to partner you know, right. with us. Don't bring me a solution. Vendors, listen to that as well. You know, there's problems that we're trying to solve. Oftentimes, uh, you know, I'll get calls from a general manager. I just bought this cool thing from a vendor who is in here selling something. Like, really, what business problem are you trying to solve, and how will that help you improve your NPS scores, improve your service levels? You know, drive profitability. Oh, it was cool. And that's the type of response. So it's important as you're looking at you know, to develop new solutions, you get feedback from all, and you respect all players that have the ability to contribute to you know, coming up with the appropriate solutions and not have silo teams. Chris, I'd like to pursue something that you said in terms of not buying technology for technology's sake. I wonder if you could talk, and then your colleagues could talk about the role of the CIO first as being the CI know from time to time, <laughs> saying that's not a good idea. And then, at the other hand, make sure that when you say yes, that it actually happens, that you see success. And I bring this back to the analytics tool that you, analytics challenge that you started out with. And you said that you uh, saw the company by Cognos BI and assumed that it was the solution, it was the answer, we're going to have enlightenment. And in fact, it's just a wrench and you need to know what to do with it. So what's the role of the CIO in saying that's either a good idea or not? And then when you say it's a good idea, making sure that it succeeds ultimately. Well, it's, um, it, it's a, a line that, it's a full circle, right? Because we need to make sure that um, when we start out first, you know, ideas come from everywhere. So that's, that's the best thing is that ideas can come from everywhere. And my perspective is, is that I don't necessarily initially start out with no. It's, um, well, let's look at this, and from what Jeff was saying, is what's the, the business problem that we're trying to solve for? Uh, and understanding you know, that perspective first before it's just about the technology, let's talk about what's the experience that we're trying to achieve. 
and then, then look at it from how do you get there and what's the expectations of the return on that investment, whether it's increased you know, guest satisfaction, whether it's reduced costs, whether it's improved performance and just efficiency gains, but understanding it from that perspective. Uh, you know, it's our responsibilities as the technology folks is to, to provide that guidance to um, the operations so that we are making good and wise investments. I mean, the owner asked me just this week about uh, an investment that I was suggesting and making sure that, you know, it was the right thing to do for every dollar that he, you know, spends. Is it the right thing that's going to maximize the return? And, um, you know, obviously, if we don't ask those questions and if we don't think of it from a technology perspective, we're not being good executive leaders as well. Um, so, you know, I, I had somebody just recently send me one of these uh, device for in the room and, uh, you know, from, from one of the properties and saying, oh, this is really cool. We should, you know, we should put these in every room. And uh, those are the, you know, the, the great opportunities because I love to see that passion and the, the desire from the, the properties to look and be thinking about technology. That's a great partner. You want to you wanna really wrap your arms around that that and, and, and help them understand, okay, this is great, but it may not be the right solution. Let's see what you're really trying to accomplish. And oh, by the way, we're rolling out a mobile application that's going to be providing that same kind of service. So there's always, you know, the alternative. It may not be no, it may not be yes right away, but here's the path of how we're going to get there to solve that business problem. And along those lines, John, also, you know, if I look at my new role, it's a partnership. It's not just technology on the hook for ensuring that you get a return on that investment. It's the rest of the organization. And unless that rest of the organization is willing to invest, it, it's not important, and we just might as well not do it. So, you know, it's a, if there's a true partnership and a common goal and vision, we'll do it. We have to say no more often than we say yes. You know, outright no is... I don't think anybody uh, prefers that kind of an answer. The answer, I generally, I mean, it's, it's back to engagement. So we, we would generally, any major decisions, you know, we would, if it comes from, say, marketing, we would want to involve operations, franchise. There's been a lot of ideas that come out, and operations say there's no way we can even execute this. So we come together. Actually, we have a structured process to actually make that happen. It's, uh, it's called in our strategy phase. We use some Six Sigma tools that talk about product design that go back to your goals and to your point. It's a structured process that everyone's aware of, and we actually go through that. And the point of that is not the tool. The point of that is just a format for engaging people and getting the ideas down. And that's what kind of drives, firstly, is it even useful? And then the second question, obviously, the, after the ROI and all that is, is about prioritization. So last year, I received must like 80 requests for all kinds of systems, right, and changes. And then we come together as a small team of executives and decide what's really priority, and, and that's how we come to decisions. So it's definitely not straight up no, it's going to collaboration, a collaborative uh, framework to get to the right decision. What's great about Jeff's position, too, is that you know, he's looking to make sure that operations is embracing, is engaged, is aware, is trained, is actually utilizing the tool sets that we put in place. The analytics obviously help us to, to make sure that we are maximizing that investment and utilizing the tool as it's designed. You know, oftentimes, I've, I've seen it in just the last eight months with, with Omni that there's a lot of um, systems and tools and people turn over, right? And, and we don't follow through on how are you using your tools to make your job, you know, the easiest that it can be. Because you don't want, the last thing you want a front desk agent thinking about is, gosh, how do I go you know, through these five steps to do whatever it is, checking a person in, whatever. You want them engaging with the guest in front of them and having that experience and creating the moment, right? A memory that they can remember. Um, but um, it comes from having the analytics, but following through. And I think what's uh, really important for us is that after we implement something that we go back to the ROI whether it's true in dollars or it's efficiencies, and we measure and make sure that we're celebrating. And if we're not celebrating that we're following it, what are the steps that we can put in place to help them be more effective in utilizing the tool? Yeah, to bring it kind of full circle and you know, full engagement, I'll use a personal analogy outside of hotel business. Several months ago, I moved, made the decision when I moved I was going to get a, a new elliptical and a new treadmill. So I bought, I went out and found the best solution uh, I had it installed, 
And because I didn't uh, make the investment in the behavioral changes, I'm still sitting here with those original 50 pounds. So I use that in discussions with the business partners saying, don't be me, we need to get behavioral change out of this. And unless you're willing to make that investment in the time, don't make the investment in the technology. That's a great point. Uh, how do your budgets this year compare to the last year? And do you have any project that stands out in terms of spending this year that you can talk about? We're spending too much with micro, so just kidding, Boro. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Boro. Uh, you know, so one of the things we're challenged with, and this, you know, conversations with owners are much different. I had an owner conversation uh, just last week. He's about to make a significant investment in upgrading the infrastructure to address Wi-Fi issues, and he's asking me to guarantee that he won't have to make another investment in Wi-Fi for seven years. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, the, the, the spend is going up, uh, but what we are tasked with doing is how do we tie that back on return on investment? How do we do better, you know, so simplification, consolidation, integration, and we use those opportunities to reduce cost so we can make investments elsewhere. But our overall technology budget has increased significantly similar to what Vivek said earlier, especially in the case of marketing, mobility, and focused on you know, finding ways to break out of the CSA-ness over using that uh, phrase. Ours has also increased significantly over last year. Um, and again, marketing-related uh, Wi-Fi, uh, and the biggest jump is uh, information security. That's uh, gone up quite a bit. In fact, this year we are rolling out uh, tokenization and upgraded terminals at, at all our properties this year. That's a big chunk of money there, too. So. From an operational perspective, the budget went up 8% um, from year over year. And some of that is just in, you know, from an operational perspective, looking at some headcount and, and really making some changes. You know, it's funny, again, just looking at it from an operations perspective, we have a help desk that is 7 to 7 Monday through Friday. What's the most busiest time of you know, our operations in our properties? It's weekends. So you know, we're adding some headcount there so that we can make sure that we got the, the coverage on the weekends. Our capital budgets are about 44% increase over year over year. Some of that's just because of change in philosophy. You know, um, same kind of conversations. You know, I had the owner ask me again this, you know, we've been paying for PCI to get PCI compliant for four years. When are we going to be PCI compliant? And I'm like, never. We're never going to be necessarily 100% compliant and we'll never be secure because there's always new malware, new, you know, hackers that are coming out with different things every year. And so there is going to be a percentage spend. Some of that increase is also around just philosophical decisions that are changed. You know, uh, I think you know from the past they would just wait until everything just broke completely hard break and then replace it. Well, the expense of that is significant. You know, from a human perspective of training somebody new on something because if you've waited and it's died, there's probably it's probably a whole new product. Even if it's still you know a micro upgrade of the same product, it's still a really big big difference. And so the the cost is like a net new installation. Um, I did some research recently because I wanted to kind of be prepared about what, what is the industry and as a whole technology. Um, there's differences in do you combine operational and capital budgets and is that three to five, three to six percent of revenue? Um, is that net revenue? Is it gross revenue? I mean, it's all over the, uh, all over the board, but I can say from my experience that the last 12 years at least in hospitality industry, it's been anywhere from three to six percent, but it's very situational because if there's something like you know some big PCI security when you know and, and uh, Sarbanes Oxley when that happened and, and so forth, there's going to be something that drives an uptick in usually the capital side of things, and then it depends too on your business's perspective about capital versus operational budgeting. So, I you know I think that's something that we could all spend a whole hour talking about just <laughs> budget management and financial responsibilities, but it's. Uh, um, it's, it's interesting, but mine obviously has gone up too. The IT management publications are increasingly touting a new executive suite role, uh, the chief digital officer, CDO, um, with responsibilities for customer-facing technologies largely in support of marketing initiatives. 
So the question would be, is, is such a role and status warranted in the hotel industry, and what impact will that have on the CIO role? Well, I think, um, I think it's definitely a, a drive that has been needed um, because people don't, don't understand digital, to be, to be honest. I don't think they understand that it's another distribution platform of content and communication with our, with our guests at any touch point, right? And it's just gotten more complicated because it's become more technical in how we do that. Um, I think my experience is, is and where the future is gonna lay for that is that somebody's gotta step up, whether that's the marketing side, to really own it from a content perspective, or it's the technology side, owning it from how to enable that distribution platform, whether it's on the web, whether it's on a sign outside, whether it's you know on the mobile phone, but um, the digital content is, I think, about making sure the right content is delivered at the right touch point using whatever the devices of the, 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 the guest. Goes back to what Vivek was saying about, well, how do you know which device they're going to be using and making sure that the content is appropriate for that, that, that um, device. So again, I think it comes back to collaboration. I think that, um, you know, with, between marketing, operations, financial, I mean, the whole, in technology, the whole team has to be involved with solutions so that it's, it works right in the hands of our associates, it's the right experience for the guest, it costs, the, it's the right amount to invest in, and that from a marketing perspective, we're providing the best solution to engage you know, our guests. So I guess that's a long-winded answer for her. I think, it, I think that whether it's in marketing or there's a C, CDO, Chief D D um, Digital Officer, that, that uh, function needs to be there somewhere. As Chris said, it's really, it's pervasive. The digital experience cause, cuts across all of the experiences. We're seeing the conversation changing in the executive boardroom. The executives now are focused more on the digital experience and everybody really owns you know, components. The, the primary leaders are a CMO and uh, the CIO, but we are all involved in various components of that digital experience. It's even at board level discussions, you know, what are you doing on the digital experience side itself? Just changing the conversation. Don't go into detail, but how fearful are you that it's going to happen to your prop one of your properties or to your company as far as someone's going to get in and compromise? Well, it's always been said, right, that it's not, it's not if, it's when. Mm -hmm. And it's probably already happened in, to some extent. It's already probably happened in majority of some of our properties. Um, we've been knock on wood, lucky now. And I just I, I got to knock on wood somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's obviously it's very high priority. Like I mentioned earlier, you know we've upped our budget and information. We hired a CISO this year, in 2014, which was pretty reports into me and that pretty pretty good decision I think because it was you need someone with focus in this area full time. So previously the roles were kind of spread out, uh, and I think yeah, it's it's definitely it's gone up to it's being discussed at a board level, and uh, we bought cyber liability insurance, and you know so you got to do all of those things. It's just the world has changed, and I I think that my personal peeve is that I just feel that it's extremely distracting. So maybe 30% of my time is spent thinking, talking about that space at least in that this is last year which is kind of waste of our talent, right? I feel that this is like we are in, that the mindset is different. We are thinking protection, military kind of thinking, which is not our forte. And I feel that the government, I mean, who owns, I mean, you have access to the network, you have NSA spying on everyone. They should be able to, <laughs> yeah. they should be able to do more to protect that the owners shouldn't be on businesses in this whole space. It's extremely, uh, it's really backwards and it's wrong. So I think something at the government level needs to be done to protect us. At least, I'm not saying 100%, but at least, you know, do more than what's being done at this point. I'm going to ask you one last question. This is a key one, so I want you to think about the answer, okay? Now imagine, it can't be a family member, it can't be a friend, it can't be anybody you've actually met. It could be somebody alive or somebody who's not living. Who would you have dinner with? I'm, I'm Steve Jobs, without a, without a doubt. Well, I gotta go to the Almighty Himself. Yeah, it'd be Jesus Christ. You gotta. I mean, He's got all the answers. I'll take one step down. I'll do Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah.